I have Alana Jacqueline from About Time Media LLC, a company basically that provides content for the youth uh, demographics. And the reason why I have Alana on the call today is because you know one of the things about marketing these days is providing content. And I feel you know if if I'm only going to be you know providing the content myself, it can be time consuming. What if I build a community of you know experts within my niche? People, and other entrepreneurs that have the same kind of ideas uh, and to come to the website and actually you know establish their credibility even on my website as guest uh, uh, bloggers or even as you know editors that post regularly to the blog so I'm trying to figure out how do we build a community of you know such people who come regularly to post on my blog for instance and just to answer that question I, I, I reached out to Elana to you know, talk about it because she's been successfully uh, uh, being able to uh, have done this on several different websites. So, before we go into that, you know, just introduce yourself to my audience and um, let's know who you are. My name is Alana Jacqueline. I'm 20 years old and I'm the president and CEO of About Time Media. Um, we do websites like Today's Teen Online, which is by and for teens ages 13 to 21, as well as uh, a site called Maternity Teens, which is by and for pregnant teenagers. Um, and we're gearing up to launch a couple of more teen-based websites. Definitely. I mean, before we even get started into the how you go about the process of you know, building that community of uh, writers and all, all that, that want to write for your blog, I mean, how does, you know, uh, to me, it's in, you're a young entrepreneur. I mean, where do you get that... Uh, drive, you know, being so young to even want to be an entrepreneur in the first place. I think like many uh, young entrepreneurs, I don't want to work for anybody else but myself. <laughs> I think that having your own business and being able to be your own boss is one of the best opportunities that you can have. Um, and, you know, um, I think that I've uh, I've had a lot of success with learning things by myself, and I think it, it gives me a little more confidence to go out and try new things. And um, I, I find learning very exciting. And I think being an entrepreneur, you really have to find that excitement in learning new things on your own. So, what, so where did that come from? Just take us a little bit to you know the the journey of how you even got to the point where you you decided. You know, you, I mean. Because most people, most young people coming out, maybe of college or whatever, they might be thinking of getting that regular job. Where did that come from for you that you felt that you needed to, you know, pursue being an entrepreneur? Well, there's a, a couple of things. I mean, personally, um, uh, one thing was I I had a really not so great job experience right before I decided to start this business, and you know, I was like fired really heinously, and it, you know, it was just very put off by the whole idea of, of finding another job just like I had before. Um, and then it's also a matter of uh, I've always, I always want to work from home. I always want to set my own hours. Um, you know, I, uh, I just think that, I think for me personally, it better suits my lifestyle. Um, and I just, I think that I'm not a nine to five person. I just don't think that that's, I think that there are certain people who can handle that kind of lifestyle, who can, go to work from nine to five and there are certain people who just are not built like that and I just think I'm one of those people. Oh definitely. So I mean it's just something that's inside of you that you feel this whole nine to five thing, it's not it's not for me. And there has to be uh, you know, a higher purpose for me in terms of you being an entrepreneur. So what's now um where did that uh, uh the insight as to starting out what I'm trying to actually uh get you to, to speak on is how did you find that need that you know you're basically providing content for the youth, right? So mm -hmm. how did you find that that there was a need for you to even do what you're doing in the first place, and how did you even research that need in the first place? Well, actually, it's it's kind of an interesting story. But today's Teen Online, which is our, our flagship website, today's Teen actually started as a print newspaper in um, South Florida, and uh, it was started by a woman named Gwen Cohen, uh, and it was like kind of like a community newspaper. Paper was given to all the local middle and high schools. Uh, it was started around 2004, 2005, um, and pretty much the day that the concept came into uh, Gwen Cohen, the publisher's mind, she found me, and I became one of their lead writers. Um, and then in uh, 2008, the paper went out of business, 
And in 2010, I bought the rights to the paper uh, from her. Uh, and at the time, it was a nonprofit, so I kind of just took over the whole thing um, and kind of flipped it and turned it all around into a national online website that was a for-profit. Oh, definitely. So, I mean, uh, I mean, I keep hearing about how uh, people say uh, the print media and all that is you know, in decline. I mean, is that something that you know comes to your mind? You know, no, knowing the fact that you know uh, the regular news media and all that, they're all having issues with you know the way information is being dispersed today via the internet. How is that affecting how you, uh, you know, do what you're doing as a provider of content yourself? I think that when it comes to things like um, politics, newspapers, older demographics, that sort of thing, it's probably going to be around for another 10 or 15 years. But as for the younger demographics, you know, people who grew up in the um, 80s, 90s, uh, and you know, this generation now, um, we're, we're on the internet. I mean, we don't get our news from newspapers. I don't know a lot of girls who have 17 magazine subscriptions anymore, and that, you know, that's the leading one. And um, I, I, we're moving. We are totally moving on to a different format. You can see it in the bookstores that they have the Nooks and they have the Kindles. I mean, yeah. we're, we're going online. Definitely, definitely. So let's, let's now jump into even while we're here today. So um, you bought the uh, the rights to the, you know, the, the prior, uh, from, from, from the prior lady who had the company and now you decide to start the process. So I'm, I'm assuming that when you started now, you are the only person in there writing for, uh, you, 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 uh, you're the only editor in there writing and posting content. How do you now take to the next step of actually getting people involved to come in? I had like such a game plan. As soon as I started the paper, I in week one, the first week that I, I got the rights to everything, the site was online. The layout that you see right now on today's teenonline.com, it's only changed a very, very little bit. You know, I, I took a basic template, designed the site, and it was up on week one. Now week two, my plan was, okay, now I need staff. Uh, and, you know, I... Uh, I set out um, postings on, you know, sites like Craigslist and a site called ED2010, which is a fantastic site for writers who are looking for gigs. Um, and what basically, was that site again? You said it was ED what? 2010. It's also called Whisper Jobs. If you Google Whisper Jobs, it's like all about secret jobs in the magazine industry. Um, and so I, you know, not so secret. But um, <laughs> anyway, so I, put, so I put out a call like all over Craigslist and all over that site. Um, and, you know, just on random other journalism websites, things like that, um, you know, it's interesting because uh, Today's Seat Online is not a, a niche website, uh, and it's, it's often hard to find writers who are willing to write for a broader magazine, which is interesting because you would think that it would be the opposite, that you'll find more writers for, you know, broader magazines, but that's not the case. Um, Why is because that? Why is that though? Well, I have a friend who runs a, it's kind of like the same sort of online magazine as me, except instead of being focused towards teens, it's focused towards Harry Potter fans. And they are like the most like zealous, like most interested, passionate people. You know, they love, they love, love, love what they're writing about. And when it comes to the teen demographic who's writing for me, um, they're passionate, but at the same time, you know, it's, it's, it's more to build a resume, it's more to, um, you know, there's a love of writing, but it's non-specific, and it makes it harder to find those people who are going to be committed and are going to be there submitting articles every week. Um, but anyway, I, I ended up having a lot of success in my first week of looking for people. Um, I think my first week I got 10 writers on board, um, and that was great. And, you know, the next week I had 10 more and 10 more. And next thing I knew, I had a staff of, like, 80 people. Um, wow. Yeah. So, I mean, so me, posting me, on Craigslist. Uh, let, me, let me, I want to dive into that because you say you had, you know, you, you, put, a, you, put, so you put an ad on Craigslist, you know, tell them specifically, and also some other websites that you mentioned previously that, that uh, uh, is caters to, towards writers. And so you put the ad out saying you're looking for writers to come on to, you know, to be on board on what you're doing, but they knew from the get-go that they were not coming in to write about specific topics. They were coming in to write about general topics that's centered around the, the youth demographic. Is that Was that the case? 
Yeah, that's pretty much the case. I mean, I had, uh, like with every posting I put, you can write about entertainment, fashion, sex and relationship, real life, you know, all these issues that I listed. Um, but, you know, it's a very broad kind of list of things they can write about. It's nothing specific. So sometimes I had writers who would come on and they would say, I just want to write about health issues. And that's all I want to write about. And I have others that just want to write about, you know, entertainment. And that's fine. So you get a mix of people who, you know, want to write about specific niche things. And those are actually yeah. the ones who remain the most committed over, you know, over time. Oh, definitely. And so, like, I mean, what, I mean, you're starting out uh, as a new company. What exactly are you promising them that, you know, they're all excited to be part of the group? Because was there some kind of uh, payments involved that you were you know, promising them income? What was that exactly? No, I'm, I'm, you know, in, in the beginning, I was not making any money. I'm living off my savings. I mean, that's where I, and I told them, I was very honest with my writers. I'm like, look, guys, I can, you know, do excellent publicity for this site, and I can make sure that we're seen and that you're read. As for money, I don't have any to give you, and this is a startup business. It might not happen for a while, if at all, um, and they were very understanding of that. Um, and another issue was, you know, the first couple of months that I started the business, it remained a nonprofit. Um, and so what I could get them at the time was community service hours if they were in high school. Okay. And, um, you know, I, I told them this when they signed up and, um, and they said, okay, great. And then once we, once we were beginning, once I got the idea to switch to a for-profit, I knew I would no longer be able to give community service hours, so you know I had to ask my writers before I did that. I had to consult with them to see if they would stay on board. And I, you know, I sent out a mass email and I said, um, you know, who would be comfortable remaining on uh, on staff with no community service hours? And absolutely everyone said, no problem, still on. And at the time, no one had asked for community service hours yet, so they were really in it just to publish. So I'm, 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 to me it's kind of mind-boggling that people would just sign up just to write and uh, okay, what was the incentive from your perspective? What do you think was the incentive to them? As someone who wrote for today's teen, as a teenager myself um, and didn't get any payment for it, I mean for me it was knowing that all of my friends and my family and people that I didn't even know were going to be reading something that I wrote. Um, I remember being in school and you know seeing kids reading my article right in front of me and not knowing that I wrote it and I could kind of peek over and say, I did that, you know, and that's, I think that's something that's kind of like a pride that you really can't get anywhere else and that's uh, a big reason that a lot of writers go into this industry. Um, and to get a job right now in, in the, you know, magazine community is extremely, extremely competitive. Um, so to build that portfolio as much as you can in middle and high school is extremely important. So this was uh, a stepping stone in their careers. Oh, okay. So are the writers themselves actually uh, youths, uh, you know, um, in high school and maybe even in college? Is that the case? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And so they're using this as, as a stepping stone to actually build their portfolio so that I mean, when they uh, maybe graduate from uh, you know university as journalists or writers and all that, then you know definitely have this portfolio that they can showcase yeah. and say you know well oh, I've done all this. I, I, I guess I understand the, the incentive yeah. to them at that point. But also you said that you know trying to get people to write for specific topics, which that's one of the reasons why I wanted to uh, get you on the call to talk about because my own topic is you know it's a little bit niche, and I'm sure a lot of the audience members might have you know niche business that they're working on. And want to you know build that community of people that you know experts that want to come on their blog and contribute. Mm -hmm. What, from your own perspective, do you think that they should uh, be aware of, or they should uh, uh, you know convey to the writers in order to get them to get involved? But not only getting involved, to write about broad topics like how they they are on your website, but specifically niche topics. What are the challenges with that too? Um, well, I mean, as far as having a niche topic website, you need to go straight to the source. Uh, and that's something that I'm working on right now with my site, Maternity Teens. I'm literally trying to find pregnant teenagers between the ages of 13 to 21, which is like, you know, it's difficult to find uh, girls like that who are, want to write, but that's really what you have to look for. Um, you have to focus on that demographic. The, the best um, advice that I have uh, and, and that I've learned with, with today's Teen Online is that um, the only way to reach your demographic is to have your demographic write your content. Wow. You know? wow. 
I mean, that's that's it because they need to be writing in a way that's you know blog friendly. It's it's personal. It's you know it's like having a conversation with your you know with your audience. You need to be um, able to relate to them on the level. That's like whenever we do interviews, we try to get a fan to interview the celebrity. Otherwise, it's you know it's like kind of how are you going to ask the right questions? How are you going to give the right answers? So whenever you're doing a niche business. Look for your demographic and ask them to come and work for you. And usually, they'll be so excited about what they're doing, they're not going to ask for much in return besides the pleasure they get from being able to share what they know with those who are like-minded. So I, I get what you're saying, and let's even try and see if we can make that even more concrete in the sense that you say, okay, if you if you're writing about a specific niche topic, look for the, the demographic that is affected by that uh, topic that you're writing. So in, in my case, for instance, now I'm trying to give the audience a means to you know, uh, have, you know, an example to back what you're talking about. So uh, I'm writing specifically about outsourcing, virtual assistants, and maybe entrepreneurship, lifestyle design, and all that. So mm -hmm. and I have people who are my colleagues who also you know, provide services like that for other entrepreneurs. So they are like virtual assistants or virtual assistant providers like myself. And then mm -hmm. on the other side of the scale, you have the entrepreneurs themselves who are potential clients. So now I have two kind of people that I can actually get, you know, uh, go in front of to try and see if I can get them to be part of the community to, and, and talk uh, towards the subject. Is that the case or would you say I should focus only on the, the professionals who, the virtual assistants and the virtual assistant providers who are providing the services to the, to the entrepreneurs or should I only focus on my potential clients who I want to have them become, you know, eventually become uh, clients of us? Who do you think I, I should bring in? I think you should bring in both. I think anyone anyone who is coming to your website to read the information should be the people who are writing it. Okay. You know, I think it's like a matter of we are our own experts. You know what I mean? Definitely, definitely. And, and yeah. I like the point you made because it, it really made something very clear to me. So, I mean, some people might be in a situation where the actual act of writing itself, in my case, I, I mean, Writing is difficult because also reading is difficult because I, 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 instead of reading a book, I like I rather uh, listen to the book, audio book. So mm -hmm. how can I mean? So people might be in my own kind of situation. How can uh, you know people who want to actually uh, still get out the information out there? What other ways can they still create a community and you know continuously pump out content and not necessarily have to be writing? You, you get my point? Absolutely. We're a multimedia kind of company now. I mean, that's where you have to be at all times. With any company that you have now, you have to be a website. You have to be a podcast. You have to be a YouTube channel. You have to Twitter 140 characters for people who don't want to read things that are long. You have to do sound bites. I mean, you have to do audio clips on the website. It is a matter of reaching different kind of listeners. And not everyone is a reader. Not everyone is, you know, a... Uh, um, an audio listener. Um, some people are visual, have pictures. You need to be able to reach every different type of um, listener in your audience. So I think definitely use utilize all types of media to reach your audience. Well, I mean that's a good point. But won't, won't one come to a point where it's like you have all these many things that you have to implement because you're trying to be multimedia and you know audio, uh, video, all the different things, you know, Twitter and all that, but. How does one now really know, okay, of all the different things I'm trying, which ones are really, really working, which ones really resonate with my audience? Well, you have to, you know, look at your statistics to really find that out. Um, for me, a lot of our, I mean, I have a statistics counter, you know, you have statistics on everything. You have it on YouTube, you can see how many views you have, um, and then you have it on the website, and you can see, you know, where photo shoots are picking up more than text and things like that. Um, so definitely always keep a look at your statistics and that should help you figure out um, what kind of audience your audience is um, coming to your website. Okay. And, and so now we're going back to the fact that we have people already interested. Now, in, in, in my case now, I, I'm looking at people who are potential service providers and also potential clients, inviting them to become part of the community to, you know, to, to, to talk about the, the niche topic from their own perspective. Uh, the, the question now I'm trying to figure out now is how do you even manage all that? How, how do you edit the okay when they now start pumping the information? How do you manage that? How do you edit that? I'm trying to figure out how you you know make do what you do. How you manage? Wait, sorry. How you manage like 
yeah, when the content start comes uh, coming in from you know uh, from the people who are not part of the community, they are willing to uh, provide content to your blog, right? Mm -hmm. How do you manage all that information? Oh, you mean like when I have articles coming in and I have people trying to get in touch to? Ugh, it took me a while to figure this out, and um, and I can tell you that the first couple of months with today's scene online, I was up 24-7, I was not sleeping, there was constantly on the phone, constantly on Skype, just constantly in contact with all 80 of my writers. Um, yeah, it was it was not um, not great, but uh, I, you know, I found a much better system now, um, and I, I utilize, um, sorry, my dog is freaking out on me, I utilize everything that I possibly can from, um, you know, Gmail is I think the best way to manage your email. Um, and then I use Skype so that I, I'm able to keep track of all the conversations that I have with all my writers because it saves it pretty much forever. Um, I can look back on conversations I had a year ago with, with all my writers. Um, and then I use things like uh, when we want to have a meeting. First I tried having a meeting with all my writers on Skype. It turns out when you have 80 people in a chat room on Skype, it doesn't work too well. Um, so I found that the best way to have meetings with people was via Ustream. Have you heard of that? Oh, Ustream, the, the live streaming uh, tool. Right. So what I would do is um, you would, my writers would all come into the room and they would all see me on video and they would all be in a chat room and I could answer questions over all of the general chatter. Um, I would use things like that. Um, what else do I use? I might like made a list of all the uh, programs that I use. Oh, and so then, right, so I have, I had 80 writers submitting articles at one time. Um, and at that point, the way that my website was run, every article went to my email, and I would have to take every article, put it in a post, format it, put the pictures, do all the SEO marketing for it, buy my, that's just no sleep. So, <laughs> Um, you figure out a better system though. Now all the writers are able to log into the website, post their articles, and um, I can edit it from there or approve it or whatever um, I need to do. And um, that's been a much better system. But you know, it takes some time to figure out what technology you're going to utilize that's going to work best for you. Yeah. Um, Google Documents is actually something that's really uh, been great for us. Uh, I have. Um, Let's see. I have about three types of documents that I give to all my writers, uh, and they're all editable. Everyone on staff can type in them and save them, um, and we, it's all live updates. So we use things like um, a grab sheet, which is where all of our article ideas go. And on this grab sheet, it's, um, it's like a Google document that looks like an Excel document, and it's got a couple of different sections. It has uh, the article title. The article description, um, uh, it's, it's like a sign up column where they can put their names if they want it, and then another, another column follows that that says approved question mark, and that's where I come in and approve it or not approve it for them, and then after that I have a due date column for when the article is due and expected in, you know on the website. Um, so everyone goes in, they can put up an article idea there, and then I can approve it or not approve it. Or um, I generally keep the grab sheet updated with about 80, 80 to 90 different article ideas at any given time, so that my writers constantly have a good breadth of uh, articles to choose from if they can't think of anything um, to write by themselves. So there's constant flow of ideas through that. Um, and then as soon as my writers come on staff, I have a sign up sheet for them, which, you know, everyone's in online and gives all their information, and a style sheet, which goes out to everyone that, you know, tells a little bit about how articles on Stacey Online are written, um, and what style, what we use and don't use, how you can curse and not curse, stuff like that. Okay, so what, what I'm seeing that you're saying that you do now is that you, you, you make use of certain online tools to you know, foster communication like Skype. Uh, Google Docs and some, you know, even live stream. If you guys have to actually get all online together and actually, you know, converse online by uh, uh, live, um, what's it called, Ustream. And you also have a, a, you call it a grab sheet where you you put in a list of topics that you want to cover, and okay. each of them, you know, chooses which one they they feel they're most comfortable, uh, um, basically writing the article on, and then you know, basically it kind of tells you who. Uh, is writing a specific act, article and when exactly to expect it from him, I guess. But the, the question I also ask, I also have uh, in my mind too, is that uh, I mean, 
are you the one only responsible for uh, coming up with the topics that they need to come up with? I mean, because that might be uh, even time consuming in itself to try and figure out what topics they should choose to write about. In the start, that was pretty much all that I did was, you know, I, I was the only one coming up with article ideas and um, I didn't know if I could leave that to my writers. I wasn't sure if that was something that they wanted to do or if they just wanted to grab an article and write it. Um, but after, you know, after a couple of weeks, they started thinking, well, I have an idea. Um, is, can I write this? And uh, now they're all, whenever they have an idea, they can post it on the grab sheet. And then I get an email whenever um, someone posts a new idea. And then I can go in, approve it. Um, generally, what I like to do and why I created this grab sheet was because um, I wanted to be able to discuss with all of my writers every article that they were writing. Okay. Um, so, I mean, and that's difficult when you have so many people on staff, but I want to... You know, it's great that they're going to be able to have their article published, but I want to be able to mentor them a little bit as they move along through this, because I think that is something that they do find beneficial, and another reason why they want to be on staff is because they do get some sort of one-on-one -on -one help moving forward with their career, um, and not, not just me going in and editing an article and posting it. Okay. So, uh, you yeah. know. Definitely. So I, I now see how it starts with the grab sheet. You started out putting out the list of, you know, uh, uh, pending articles that you want to write and then over time it's now morphed into a situation where they themselves can also include you know, you know put in suggestions of what they think is relevant to what uh, um, needs to be written about for that topic and you also mentioned something in regards to mentoring them as to uh, basically writing in a, you know I guess every content provider they have a certain voice in which you're going to write according to right there's a framework of how you want your content to always sound like and right. then you have writers who have their own style, but they always have to write around that same framework. So that hence come the mentoring thing that you were talking about. But also there might be people who are part of the group that, you know, everything works very well with them. And then there's also going to be those people who uh, they, they're challenges with where, you know, so how do you, you know, uh, now that you have a situation where you have all these people writing for you, in terms of the mentoring to make sure people write the way and in the sound and the, in the voice that you want your, uh, your 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 content source to always be like, your website to always be like. How do you go into more details of in, in regards to the, the mentoring process? Well, I'll give you like an example. Um, you know, the first couple of weeks, everything was going well, and I really hadn't had a problem with people understanding the style that I wanted on the website. Um, and then I came across this one guy who submitted an article to me that I was just kind of like, hmm. <laughs> and, I, and it was difficult because it was the first time that I had to go about telling, it was really the first time I had to go about telling someone, no, that's not going on the website. Um, and I, you know, I had a little bit of experience being an editor before, but uh, nothing with this kind of level and I wasn't really sure how to approach it. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a bit of a trial and error, but basically um, I was very flat out with him and just, I am to on Skype and explained, well, this part can't be in here because, and this part can't be in here because, but don't give up. I want you to go back and redo it and submit again. And we must have gone through this draft about 10 times. And I mean, just complete rewrites of this one article that was like a very, it was like non-integral article to the whole magazine. It was nothing. It was kind of like a side piece, a filler piece. Um, but it was important, I think, because despite the fact that he didn't quite understand the style yet of the newspaper or the magazine, he was talented and, um, and I really did want him on staff and I, I feel that way about a lot of my writers that I don't bring them on staff unless I believe that they're truly talented and they, they really could do well. Um, so we worked through this piece about ten times and then he got it and um, the next time we worked on his next article about nine times and then eight times and now he submits an article every week and he uh, doesn't need any, basically any editing at all. I mean, they all have the capacity to understand how to write for a specific type of newspaper, but you have to take the time to teach them because nobody comes into a job um, without training and knows how to do everything perfectly. And you have to have some level of sympathy and understanding for that and not just give up on all your writers because if you do, you're going to find yourself uh, with no writers. <laughs> I totally understand. So I guess what I'm taking from that is uh, 
if you if you want to create a site where people all come together to uh, you know write towards a specific topic, then you have to you know basically brainstorm on what how how do you guys want your your content to be like? How do you want it to sound? I, I mean, what's the look and feel of the content you want to always post? And then the next step is to really figure out how how can you convert that message to the people who are coming in to you know be part of that community to write for you so that over time as you continue working with them they get used to it and you have to be patient with them to basically walk through the kinks to make sure that you know I mean it's gonna be a challenge when you're working with anybody you know so you know you have to spend that time until they get it I, I guess that's what the, the point you were making there yeah, I mean with it's like with any with any job that you have you have to as a as a boss or as a CEO as a president whatever you are um, if you're managing other people you have to give them job training I mean no matter how talented they are you can't expect them to come on board knowing exactly what to do exactly when to do it because that's completely unfair and you're gonna miss out on a lot of talent definitely and also because you guys are providing content I mean uh, how do you manage uh, plagiarism to make sure that you know Nobody's content is being scraped and just you know being re regurgitated. How, how do you you, know, you understand what I'm saying? Is you yeah, yeah. make sure that your content is always original. So now you have a bunch of people all contributing content. What kind of systems you guys have in place to really manage that? Um, a lot of it is honor system. I mean, there's not there's not a really big way to make sure that it's not you know something that's stolen from somewhere else. Basically, whenever they sign up, um, we. We make sure that uh, they sign a form saying they're not to plagiarize. But then again, there's not. I don't think that there's much reason for them to do it because it's again, it's not something where they're getting paid by word or something where they're going to be, uh, you know, it's beneficial to them to do that. It's something that is really about them and about you know the content that they're writing is representing themselves. If they steal it off of someone else, it's it doesn't make any sense to do it. I think for us. I see your point. I definitely see your point. And so uh, that now brings me to a question of um, how you giving them credit for this. I understand the point that you know they, they're trying to build a resume, but uh, on your side, how do they actually get credit for being the writers of it? Well, they get their name on the article. I mean, that's if you look into any newspaper, that's pretty much about it. Um, they build as much uh, of a portfolio as they can, and they get. I, I think another thing that, that really motivates them is um, the more that you write for Today's Scene Online, the more opportunities that you're going to get. Um, and what I mean by that is we have uh, a program for a press release that they have to go through, um, you know, where you can interview celebrities and you can uh, interview different people that, I mean, it's kind of like this where people want different information from people on a more personal level and um, we really give them the ability to do that because we are a bigger company, a bigger website um, that more celebrities are going to be apt to recognize so that they'll be more likely to speak with them. Um, so that's definitely been a big drive. A lot of people will come into the magazine and be like, okay, when can I interview a celebrity? And I'm like, as soon as you write a couple of articles and show us what you can do and go through our press training process and then we can get you through to that. And that's a big motivator for them. Okay. okay. And also the reason why I even asked that question was because I was thinking more in lines of, uh, you know, maybe the person coming to your website to write also have their own website. Maybe they have their own business, but they just feel they want to also have their yeah. voice on there. So I've seen cases where people are guest, guest blogging and you see a link that goes to their website. So is that the case of what you guys do or you, you don't even do that at all? Um, I don't think generally we don't link to um, our writers' websites unless it's like specifically mentioned in an article, which I'm not sure we've had yet. But a lot of our writers do, do have their own websites. So, I mean, they, I think they've gotten some, I mean, if you Google their names and they, they put our, their articles from today's team on their websites and I think it's helped them. Yeah, I, I can see how even just the name itself can help because I mean, anybody who's really wanting to get in contact with them just really has to Google their name and oh well, they have a bunch of articles on your website that show up and also maybe on their own website too. So whoever's uh, trying to get in really needs to get in contact with them that bad does the math to know okay, this is how I can get a hold of this person outside of your website as well. So like, that's a good thing. Uh, I want to go into kind of like, you know, uh, you starting out the business, you're a young entrepreneur, uh, trying to get people to take you seriously. I'm sure there had to be some challenges that you had to deal with. Mm -hmm. um, 
You know, I think on some level it's been a lot easier for me than for a lot of young entrepreneurs uh, just because of the way that I was raised. And my mother, uh, my mother is a TV producer. Uh, okay. for, yeah, she does uh, the balancing act, which is the morning show on Lifetime. And since I was like very young, she's always kind of raised me in a way that's um, part teenager, part businesswoman. And um, you know, we've—I pretty much I think I've had a business card since I was about ten years old. So I, I think that I've um, I've been able to have a lot more opportunities as far as networking and as far as learning how to represent myself as a businesswoman um, and not just as Alana, um, which has been a blessing and a curse in some cases, but um, I, I think that uh, that's her guidance has definitely helped me along the way. Definitely. I mean, Alana, I really appreciate you coming on the show because, I mean, so to, to, to say the truth to the audience, this is really a thing of me being selfish to want to learn how I need to do the same thing because, I mean, I want to be able to not have to keep writing or you know, put in blog posts. I want to, you know, have the audience keep getting that good content and doesn't necessarily have to be me providing it. So I said, you know, why don't I find somebody who already does it, get them on the interview, and hopefully, you know, the audience finds this useful as I personally uh, find uh, you know, this interview uh, useful. And just before you go, I want to, you know, if any of the audience want to get a hold of you, how best can they, you know, contact you? Um, they can reach me at editor at todaysteenonline.com. And is there a Twitter page that you're on that we can send them to or Facebook? Um, well, Today's Teen has Today's Teen Tweet, which is at Twitter, Today's Teen Tweet. Um, I have a Twitter, but I don't update it as regularly as I should. You can find me on Facebook if you just search for Alana Jacqueline. Um, but you can also visit my website, which is alanawrites.com. Okay, thank you. And before I let you go, I want to do any uh, young entrepreneur that is listening to uh, you know this interview and sees you on this interview. I'm sure it's going to be inspirational to them. Give them something that you know takeaway that uh, I want you to give that young entrepreneur listening to this show a takeaway that you think that you think they need to listen to. I think that um, what I've learned this year. And it's really, it's almost been less than a year that, that I've really started this business and committed myself to this. Um, I think that you have to know going into it that for a while, it's going to suck. You're going to be broke, you're not going to have any money, you're going to want to go out and have lunch and you can't, and people aren't going to want to help you, and you're going to develop these horrible bags under your eyes that you're going to need extra expensive concealer that you can't afford to cover them. And um, it's not going to be fun for a while. But you really have to commit to it, and along the way, it does become fun, and it does become worth it. Um, and if it's something that you're really, truly, totally excited about before you go into it, because you won't be excited after two months, um, stick to it. I mean, really work at it, uh, and it'll it'll benefit in the end. It'll be worth it. Oh, thank you very much. What, what a wonderful way to end it. I really appreciate you coming on this interview. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. It was fun. Okay. So we're done. What do you think? Awesome. That was nice. That was great. <laughs> Hopefully it was great. when the uh, video gets edited, the video... You know. So welcome back. I hope you enjoyed the video. And I really want to know what exactly you think. I mean, if I suck and if I'm not doing a good job, I want to know. Because by your input and your comments, your suggestions, your feedback, that's how I'm going to you know, improve on the entire package of what I'm sharing with you. I really want to improve so that you know that your time is well spent when you watch my videos. And if I do good on you know, interviews and you like certain things I do, please let me know so I can even improve upon that as well. And I want to thank you really because your time is well spent and, and you know, I mean, your time is you know, important to me. And I want to make sure that I continuously put this information in, right in front of you. So I want you to join my community. And in order to do that, you need to click on the link that says get the free ebook, enter in your name and email, and you will receive as a gift from me my free ebook titled The Entrepreneur's Guide to Running a Business in the Cloud. The reason I do that is because I want to share with you that information. You know, you can check it out and make use of it in your business. In the same vein, I will be sending you email updates every time I have new blog posts, as well as if I have you know new stuff that is not even on the blog, I want to share with you. That way we can stay in contact. One more thing. 
before you go, I want to also let you know that if you are really serious about finding, hiring, training, and even working with virtual assistants, if, if, if right now you want to get that started, why don't you sign up for my free webinar where I share everything about the entire process. And you can get to do that by clicking on the link on the very top of my blog where it says sign up for the free webinar. Again, thanks for watching the video and I, see, I hope to see you next time.